Signing it, please. No, it's all right. No, it's all right. Let go. Let go. It's all right.
really not. There's a, uh, oh, that's a bit loud, isn't it? Okay, there's um, a register going around at the moment, uh, as usual. I'm still not quite sure what names are supposed to be on the register. They had an awful lot of people that weren't on the register last time. Can I just ask you to sign it, if possible, um, just with initials, just for your initials, rather than a tick? Okay, because I, <laughs> otherwise I, it's not personal enough. I can't really distinguish one person from the next. So that register should be going around at the moment. Uh, and that would be helpful. Now, today, remember, we're having a three-hour lecture, so I will try to provide plenty of breaks. Um, I can hear something in this speaker. Can you hear that noise? Yeah. What's that about, I wonder? Is that Pavlov's dog? <laughs> Knocking. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't think we had Pavlov's dog. I'll just keep turning up all the volumes and maybe we'll... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> right, then we don't have any of him. Right. I have Pavlov's dog ready and waiting for you. So today we're going to be looking at what happens in the brain when we learn. And this material, all the material that we cover today, apart from our little teaching and learning notes, which is when I talk about why I'm teaching in a particular way or a particular teaching strategy, apart from that, um, everything else will, will potentially be in your, in your little examination in a few weeks' time. Um, did it manage to record last time on YouTube? Hooray! Okay, it did. That's good news. Um, in terms of our teaching and learning questions, this is when I try to link how I'm teaching to what we know about the brain. Hello. I'm going to be asking, why have I reduced the text on the PowerPoint? I have made a real effort to do that. So I've reduced the amount of text on each PowerPoint. Why have I done that? 
Why do we do that? Why is that good practice? Why are we being tested on last week's work? Yeah, I'll give you a little test in a minute, actually, see what you remember. It'll be interesting. And I'm also going to be asking you to explain things to each other as well. So there's three little strategies that I'm using, very common in a classroom, some of them are. Why, why am I doing those? How, how does that... How can that be justified in terms of what we understand about how the brain learns? Right, so I did say I was going to give you a little test. Um, do you remember what A is? Uh, put your hand up if you can remember. No, don't shut up. Put your hand up if you remember. Very good. About that lady there. Yeah. Dendrites. Very good. Excellent. Well done. What about uh, B? Put your hand up for B. That gentleman there. Excellent, excellent. What about, uh, oh, C is a bit tricky, because we didn't really talk very much about it. Oh, but we've got a lot of people. Have you got degrees in biology? Put your hand up if you've got a degree in neuroscience. <laughs> Ooh, okay, okay. Oh, there's two, is, that, is your hand up as well? Yes, so we have two degrees in neuroscience. I might, I make, I, your hand's up as well. You've got a degree in neuroscience. I might ask you occasionally if I get stuck. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, so yes, what is, what is B then? B. Sorry, C, beg my pardon. Excellent, excellent. Um, what is F? That lady there. Excellent, yes, it's producing myelin. What is... Oh, G is not really... I think... I'm not sure what G is supposed to be. <laughs> G is just in outer space. What about... Yeah, it's just gone. What about E? What's E? Yes, myelin. myelin. Yeah, it's supposed to be a myelin sheath, but yeah, looks more like a Schwann cell, really. But okay, there we are. Still not. Oh, I think G was supposed to be an axon. I think I was referring to the whole length of the axon. I think that was the idea. Excellent. Okay. What about this? Do you remember this? What is X? in this diagram. What is X? Can you put your hand up if you remember? Yes. Sodium, yeah. Sodium channels. Sodium channels open. That's the first thing happens. Then there are more, more channels open. The channels begin to close just as the Y channels open. Can you remember what the Y channels are? Uh, what about that lady there who's hiding behind her laptop? Potassium. Potassium. Yes, that's right. Potassium ions. Um, potassium channels. Excellent. You're doing very well. There you are, those are the answers, so you can feel affirmed. And you can shout, you can shout this one out. What is the name of the lobe that is labelled A? Frontal. Frontal, very good. What is the name of the lobe that is labelled B? Parietal, very good, very good. I have to do it as well, <laughs> just to remind myself. What's the lobe that is labelled C? Occipital, excellent. And D? Temporal, brilliant. Okay, so I'm just revising a little bit of what you should have learnt already. This is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be thinking about what learning is in the brain, um, which translates pretty much as memory when you start looking at the science. Of course, what educators think learning is is, is, is not necessarily the same as that, and we have to be aware of that. There can be a, a language difference between the terms that are used in neuroscience and psychology compared with education but we'll be thinking about how networks can change the efficiency of their connections we didn't really talk about that last time we were just talking about um, how a network thinks and we didn't really spend very much time thinking about how it learns but we did say it's something to do with changing the efficiency of those connections um, we're thinking particularly about one type of connection called a chemical synapse synapse being the technical name for a connection and we'll be looking at two different um, ways in which that can happen that are related to each other, early and late long-term potentiation. That provides a biological basis for how that change in efficiency can occur. We'll be thinking about working memory, what that means in terms of the brain, uh, one particular model of what it might mean anyway. Um, and we'll be reminding ourselves how memory is actually distributed throughout the brain. And we'll also be looking a little bit at evolutionary psychology, um, which is kind of an example of what happens when psychology um, tries to 
ignore the neuroscience, really. Um, okay, <clears throat> so possibly the simplest form of learning that we can think about is, is conditioning. And the simplest form of conditioning is classical conditioning. And classical conditioning happens when uh, a stimulus um, starts getting uh, associated uh, with, a, with a condition response. And the classic example of this is Pavlov's dogs, which we will now try to awaken again. And actually I could do with um, a volunteer to do this. It's, it's quite simple really. All you have to do in order to make this dog conditioned is to before you hang on, let's see if this is right, before you feed it, you have to signal in a particular way. And you have to be quite consistent about this. So you have to use the right the same signal again and again. So you can wake it up with a trumpet and then put some meat in its bowl. And if you keep doing that, then eventually the trumpet will become associated with the meat in the bowl. And just blowing the trumpet will cause the dog to salivate. This is what Pavlov found out. But you can choose what stimulus you're going to associate with. I mean, it could be the bell. There are other sounds on there if you want to choose those. But the important thing is always to produce that stimulus before you put the meat in the bowl. So we've got a volunteer to do this. All you have to do is drag the things across. Oh, go on. Go on. Go on. Come on, somebody go. Somebody come down the front and do this. It's good fun, it's good fun. Do you want to do it? Just come down the front, that's all. Well done. We've got a volunteer, we've got a volunteer. Yay! So what you have to do... So I'll, I'll give you expert tutoring. So you click on there. Yeah, just to start the game. Now... When, when you, you've got to decide which one you're going to go for. You're going to go with the, for the tweeter, the hooter, sorry, the drum or the bell. Which one are you going to choose as your... The bell, okay. Okay, put some food in quick then. Okay. Very good. Oh, it tastes Yeah, we like that. Just let it go to sleep now, right? And then just, just do it again. Yeah, I think so. Would he eat the bananas? I don't know about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna put things back a bit, so you're going to have to... Okay, let's yeah. do Not the banana. Hang on. No, no. Oh, all right. Oh, you've got to wake him up. Wake, <laughs> wake, oh, no! <laughs> now, he, now he doesn't... Now he's getting confused now. Let him go to sleep. Go as well? Let him go to sleep. Hang on. Let him go to sleep. Right now, ring the bell. Put the food in, the meat, the meat. Yeah, he, we, might, we might still do it. Dribble, Try the bell. This time. Try that one there. No, because he's all confused, you see. Bananas yeah, he doesn't know if it's going to be a banana or it's going to be meat. That's the trouble. <laughs> oh! No, no, I thought you'd done it then. One more, one more. We've only got one more chance. Exactly what my dog does. We've run out of meat. <laughs> We're going to have to try it again. Try it again. Press more. I try again. Yeah. Right. Now this time, don't try the don't banana. Don't do the banana. Banana, silly was bit, yeah. banana was a bad idea. Right. Bell. Let's do this. That's it. And then hooter again. You've got to stick to the same sound because that will confuse him otherwise. That's it. Hooter again as soon as he's asleep. Oh, get that in quick. <laughs> this is going well. This is going well. He's still awake. <laughs> Ah, he's salivating. He's thinking of meat even before you put yeah. it in. Look, you've got your diploma. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, 
well done. Okay, so that's uh, very well done. That per- uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Actually, who was it? Who was your name? Debbie. Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. That was that was brilliant. Okay, so what we've just seen is an example of forward conditioning. And you can see here the example with these two mice where the light bulb comes on first and then the cheese arrives. And if you keep on doing that, then eventually putting the light bulb on will cause the, um, the, the mouse to start preparing to eat food, even though the cheese is not there yet. So you can have um, forward conditioning, which is what we sh- showed just then, or you can have simultaneous conditioning um, where you actually present both things together or you can have second order conditioning where you associate the light bulb with the sound and then the sound becomes trained, you train the sound to be associated with the cheese and then when you put on the light bulb because the light bulbs become associated with the sound and the sound is associated with the cheese then the light bulb will produce the salivation so that's called second order conditioning So, you can explain a number of more sophisticated apparent forms of learning in terms of conditioning. Um, You have second order conditioning, which is uh, what we've just talked about. We can have temporal conditioning, where there's actually a time delay. You can have extinction, which is sort of what Debbie showed with the bananas, because uh, the dog was just beginning to salivate with respect to the bell noise, was it? But then when the bell started becoming associated with the bananas, then that conditioned response became extinguished. And so we actually we lost pace in terms of the learning. Um, and then you can have um, blocking, inhibition. Quite, there's a whole range of these different types of, of learning behaviours which can all be explained in terms of conditioning. And there are also some um, phenomena which we've observed which may possibly be examples of conditioning. So one example was Hans, the the clever horse. And this horse became very famous um, in the beginning of the last century because it appeared that this horse could count. So, you know, the owner would say, um, how many bananas have I got? and the horse would take its foot and it would go one well it wouldn't say one (laughs) it would go with its foot amazing it did four clops four bangs of its hoof and I am actually holding four bananas isn't that incredible that hands can actually count and then they realised that in fact what really happened was that there was a conditioned response forming between the way in which the owner was behaving in terms of their expectations, signalling with their face, signalling with their expressions, signalling with their body language, that in fact, you know, now was the time to stop hitting the ground. And that's what the horse was responding to. So even this rather amazing example of, of animal learning could be explained in terms of simple conditioning. Unfortunately, horses, we now know, uh, can't formally count. But animals do have a sense of quantity, and we will talk about that um, in the next lecture. But how about um, you know, less reflexive responses? Because salivation, you could argue, is a very reflexive response. You know, it's the body responding um, automatically that requires some anticipation of the consequences of, of doing something. So another type of conditioning is called operant conditioning, um, sometimes known as instrumental conditioning. And here, the animal or the person needs to learn that if I do this, then I will get a reward, which is, or I will get a punishment, which is a slightly different thing than just Um, a bodily response becoming associated um, with a particular stimulus. You've actually got to think forward a little bit. You've got to anticipate a little bit into the future and think, well, I know if if I do this, then I might get a reward. 
Anticipation, you could argue, requires more of a cognitive construction. It requires you to, to think about what might happen in the future. And there are some uh, more amazing examples as well of, of learning. Um, simple, humble rats, for example, appear to be able to take the second best route when the first route is closed off. Now, how do they know that? You can sort of imagine how they might, with a conditioned response, just become used to a particular route. So they get drawn, if you like, as a result of salivation or whatever, towards the food source down one particular familiar road. But how is it that they know what the next best route is? That means they must have some map in their mind of all the routes. And this is, um, you know, this is quite incredible in some respects that um, it's possible you know, for, for a simple animal like that with a very small brain to actually develop a, a ground plan of the routes and think about not just an alternative route but the next best route. So, how does a neuron have to behave in order for us to learn these things and to make educated guesses about the next best option when the first option is not there? We've already talked about how a neural network thinks. We know that if a neural network has the right connections, then, oh, I've left behind my... And this still hasn't got any batteries in it. <laughs> if you have the right input here, then if these connections are well in particular ways, then as the information feeds through, so you'll get a completely different output there. And that is a way in which you can transform one type of information into another type of information. So you can take in a visual scene, process it perhaps, and the output could be the best possible options in terms of where you might find food, say. That's how you, you think. But how do you actually learn? How do you get to that point? So that the connections are the right connections to be able to produce those right outputs, those appropriate outputs. Well, to understand that, we need to think more about what a connection is. And the most important type of connection we have in the brain, the one we spend most time thinking about anyway, is the chemical synapse, the chemical connection. Now remember that when we talked about the information as an action potential coming down the axon, we were talking about it as an electrical charge floating down there. But when it moves, from the presynaptic terminal to the dendrite of the next neuron, in a chemical synapse, that movement, that crossing of the connection, is actually done chemically. And it's done in the following respect. So first of all, we have... I do wish I had my... Oh, I do! First of all, we, we start off with the action potential coming down here. That, act Ooh, dear. that action potential depolarizes the synaptic membrane around there, yeah? And that means that the channels, some calcium channels here open and calcium ions come through. There are calcium sensitive proteins attached to these vesicles and these vesicles contain what we call neurotransmitters. And those proteins change shape. And the result of that is that these vesicles start fusing with the synaptic membrane. And eventually they open. And these neurotransmitters are released. Some of these neurotransmitters, somewhat unhelpfully, other ones bind the postsynaptic membrane here. So this is the, the dendrite, if you like, of the next neuron and they bind there. Um, and what that does is to activate the postsynaptic cell in some way. It could be making it more likely to produce an action potential. In other words, it's exciting it. 
or it could be inhibiting the next neuron and making it less likely that this neuron, of which this is the dendrite, is going to fire. So it could be an excitatory connection or it could be an inhibitory connection, depending on uh, these, these receptors here and the neurons, if they're the right ones. You might say, well, that sounds a bit complicated. Why don't you just, you know, reduce, have some sort of resistor or something, or some way of just reducing the, the likelihood of the action potential jumping across. Why not have an electric synapse? And electrical synapses do exist. There's some argument to say that they were the first ever synapses that evolved electrical ones. So why have we ended up with a chemical one that is so complicated? And actually, it's the complexity of the chemical synapse that makes it so useful. It's because there are so many separate stages to this that results in the possibility of so many different processes mediating, interfering and influencing that transference of the action potential. And because of that, it means we can have a whole range of different um, processes that affect the efficiency of a synapse. In other words, so many different processes that influence information processing and learning. The electrical synapse would just have been too simple and too difficult really to mediate in all those different complicated ways that we need to have in the brain in order for us to have such complex behaviours. Now, I've got some videos. I can never find a good video. There's always, I don't know, you can make up your mind which one's better. But it's good to look at these things on YouTube, I think, because... Sorry, I should say, this is just one example. So the neurotransmitter here is acetylcholine, or as it's pronounced here, acetylcholine. Okay, and so this is just one example. There are a whole range of different neurotransmitters, a whole range of different receptors. So, so don't be confused by that. I think I might have started again. One between two, it's an exercise doing a pair. One between two. One between two. So I'm just handing out some uh, little exercise for you here. And uh, these should be done one between two. Okay, so um, if you could form into pairs and make sure that each pair has got one of these. Here's another version. You decide which ones you like the best. A chemical synapse is a special tool between two neurons that allows them to communicate without being physically connected. One between two. A synapse One between has two. The presynaptic neuron ends in a small bulb called the presynaptic Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't he go on? Oh dear, that lady then that other lady was so nice and relaxing. I was I was 
I don't know, I've lost her now completely. That horrible man. Oh. One between two. A chemical synapse is a special junction between two neurons that allows them to communicate without being physically connected. A synapse has several structures. The presynaptic neuron ends in a small bulk called the presynaptic terminal. The postsynaptic terminal membrane is directly adjacent, separated by a small space called the synaptic cleft. An action potential causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open in the presynaptic terminal. The influx of calcium ions cause synaptic vesicles to release neurotransmitters via exocytosis. This neuron is releasing acetylcholine. It uses across the synaptic cleft. Two acetylcholine molecules bind with one ligand-gated sodium channel at the postsynaptic membrane, opening the channel. When enough sodium ion channels open, the postsynaptic cell depolarizes and the action potential continues along the neuron. That's, that's a nice one, isn't it? I don't know what this one's like. Well, that says an unexpected error. I won't even look at that one then. Right, so what I'd like you to do now uh, is to explain what you've just seen to each other. Okay, so take it in turns. One of you goes through the explanation of how a chemical synapse works to the other person and then swap around and they'll explain to you. through observing it in humans. No, no. Okay, but it's possible to observe the transmission, like is it isolate it and like magnify it and look, is it as simple as that? Like, no, no it's it? not, no, so you, 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 I mean, so for example you, you have to, you start with a theoretical model um, and then you, what you can do is, is measure, I'm not sorry, sorry let me just put this on here. what you can do is measure, um, you know, the, the amount of, uh, so, so one of the things, the electric potential, for example, they measured in rabbits, where they were able to put in a charge here, and then they noticed that they kept putting in a charge here when this one was activated as well, and the efficiency would change. And then the next stage is, is probably to measure the transmitter that you're actually, and there's an increase in the amount of neurotransmitter during the... the, the so it's like hooking crossing. up a lot of wires to brains in action, basically. Well, it, to be honest, it's more like mouse cells in a petri dish. Yeah, put your cells in a petri dish, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Mouse cells in a petri right, dish okay. is more like it, yeah. Because yeah. that, that, that's what I could envision with cells in a petri dish, and I was trying to imagine how that no. can be like... Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question, though. I mean, I, you, I, you should ask me these things in front of everybody, I, but... Because a lot of I, no, it's it's important to stop and ask. I want to say that I will say that um, because otherwise people get the impression that we are observing this happening yeah, in a human yeah. brain, and we can't. We, yeah. All we can do is is measure concentration of neurotransmitters yeah. no, and things in a mouse cell. Helps me understand the mm. kind of like the context of it in a way better. Actually, it helps yeah. me kind of understand. But yeah. Thank you.
they're just there outside the cell, um, together with a whole load of other ions, essentially. This is where my biologist friends, who are experts in neuroscience, might be able to help me. But my understanding is that there's a reservoir of a whole different types of, of side of the synapses. <laughs> where do the calcium ions come from outside the synapse? They're just floating around, yeah, basically. They're just stuff. <laughs> I have an interesting question about how do we know all this and, and of course I should point out that we can't observe these processes as far as I know directly in, t in terms of the human brain so much of what we've found out about this is you know by little sort of mouse neurons in petri dishes and such like an experiment actually which we'll, we'll look at in a minute a similar one um, last question on this is somebody at the back with their hand up I thought somebody did maybe I imagined it I was just going to ask oh, yeah. how you just mentioned your Anything that's on the slides, you will need. You potentially need to know, <laughs> unless I say otherwise. I mean, there's, there's like Brobman's areas. I don't. I'm not going to deal with. I'm not going to ask you to name Brobman areas. But anything that's on the slides here, not the YouTube links or anything like that, you may need to know for that little exam. Right. So. Um, we haven't really still solved the problem of how this actually helps you learn anything, really. I mean, it's very clever, the chemical synapse, and I've said there's all sorts of 